We're in conversation with Jeff Majinkala, the CEO of Coursera, the online learning platform that all of us know about. Jeff, thank you very much for talking to us on Money Control. Uh, the interesting trend that we've seen when it comes to edtech uh, startups or edtech companies in India is the boost th that they received during the pandemic, right? Online learning. That seems to have receded post-pandemic. People are embracing offline learning again. Uh, in fact, the online learning companies are opening up offline mm. uh, uh, you know coaching centers in India so life literally has come a full circle for them yeah. uh, what's it like for Kosara are you also seeing the dip the uh, the pandemic led boost you know do you see that ebbing away for you we see on two dimensions both with education but also work a world that was pre-pandemic almost entirely place-based like you had to go to campus in order to learn you had to go to the office in order to work during the pandemic, basically all the campuses shut down and all the offices shut down. So you had to work, learn from home and you had to work from home. What we're seeing post pandemic is definitely not the same as during pandemic, mm -hmm. but it's not the same as pre pandemic. What we're seeing is a hybrid world right. where you do go to campus, but on campus, you also learn online and you might go to the office a couple of times, but you also work from home. We're working with universities all throughout India to integrate career electives, industry certificates into on-campus learning programs mm. that counts towards your college degree. And the new education policy that was just ratified allows for 40% of credits towards a college degree in India uh, to be online. And these online courses can be from universities and these online courses can also be from industry. So we call these career electives mm. that are being offered to students in traditional degree programs online and from industry leaders. So hybrid is the way forward or omni-channel like people like to call it. Abs absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the great things about hybrid is that it really allows people way more flexibility to learn when they want, where they want and with whom they want. So you don't have to just be online or just on campus. You can be doing that hybrid and the same thing with work. I was in Bangalore just a few weeks ago. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had employees in three cities in India. We had about 50 employees in three cities. Today, we have about 300 employees in 25 cities because we don't have to have people in offices. I was in Bangalore, we have 26 people in Bangalore. I asked them, I said, should we open an office? They said, no. I said, why? <laughs> they said, because if you pick an office, the traffic could they, be they said it'll, it'll be two hours. <laughs> Even though I live in Bangalore, yeah. no matter where you pick it, some of us are gonna have to drive an hour or more. So they said, we love it. We'll just go to the local WeWorks and that works great. So I, I do think there are a, a lot of advantages to having that kind of flexibility. So what kind of hiring plans do you have in India? You currently have 300 people. Will you look at expanding that? And also tell us how important the India market is for you compared to other markets, because we also see a lot of companies pushing, you know, learning initiatives, relearning, unlearning, skilling initiatives. So what kind of opportunity does that present for you? Well, there was a report from McKinsey, I won't get it exactly right, but they said something like in 10 years, India will be 20% of the global workforce. Hmm. So any company has to be focused on India as the, a centerpiece of their strategy. Certainly, of course, that's Coursera we are. We work not only with uh, 18 million learners in India who are on Coursera, uh, by the way, at the rate it's growing, India will surpass all of Europe on Coursera within probably 12 to 18 months. What about the U.S.? Uh, the U.S. is, pro I would guess, probably two years at okay. this rate. So we'll okay. see. But it, uh, India will it's almost certainly, will almost certainly be much. the largest segment of learners on Coursera in a matter of three years, almost is for it sure. The fastest growing it's, the fa it's not the fastest growing, but for its size, it is. Africa is growing more quickly, but from a smaller base. And there's a lot of young people in Africa, obviously. But when we think about India the, uh, and, and our plans there, I mean, we work with businesses. Uh, we just did a, a large partnership with Reliance. So we're very happy to be upsigling not only employees at Reliance, but their families as well. I mean, Reliance has really made a commitment to skilling and education for employees and families, which I think is fantastic. We're working with universities like Yitam and uh, NMIMS and many other universities who are integrating content into their degree programs. We also have partnerships. I was just in, um, in Mumbai with uh, IIT Bombay and uh, also IISC. They're both partners. They're publishing content on Coursera, not just for people in India, 
but for people all over the world. And we're working with uh, governments and states in India as well. So across the board, India is a central part of our strategy. Right. What in your mind is the biggest challenge or, you know, the biggest threat to Kosara? I mean, there's a lot of chatter around chat GPT. Yeah. In fact, I read a very interesting story yesterday which spoke about how uh, teachers in U.S. schools uh, are now thinking about new ways to give assignments because they don't want people to use chat GPT. So some of them are asking for, you know, handwritten assignments. Mm -hmm. Some of them are asking them to write out uh, drafts in class. Uh, do you think chat GPT will replace Coursera as a learning tool? Is that is that something that keeps you awake at night? You know, it definitely keeps me awake, the power of this technology. Hmm. Like all I've been doing for the last 45 days, or which came out, what, November 30th, I have been using chat GPT every day. What do you ask day. chat GPT? I, I ask it everything. I'm, I'm actually running it through the Bloom's taxonomy to, to really figure out what are the cognitive skills, if you will, of chat GPT. Yeah, it could do recall. It could do summaries. It could do evaluations. It could do analysis. It can create new things. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary and it's early. It's not perfect. It's dangerous. It's going to really disrupt things. So I frankly think it's going to open up possibilities for us to help people learn in ways that folks have never imagined. Hmm. So many learners would benefit from personalized feedback and personalized coaching and personalized help. If you're stuck in a course, if you have a really difficult concept, the ability to actually ask for more help on a certain concept that's difficult is like being in a classroom with a professor. So are you looking to integrate ChatGPT as a layer on Coursera? Absolutely, and it's going to be brilliant. Uh, have you already sort of started doing that? When yeah, can I, we see it happening? Yeah, I can't, I can't uh, uh. give you too many previews, but it's going to be very exciting. But, you know, it's not a non-profit anymore. People are actually talking about Microsoft doubling down on its investment. Sure. So, you know, will that matter at all? Because people are already worried about how their data and queries are going to be used on ChatGPT. Yesterday, Microsoft announced general availability of Azure OpenAI services. They are basically building, not basically, they just released it. Businesses can now actually integrate with ChatGPT and GPT 3.5 on Microsoft Azure. It's here. It's here. So when will we see this integration happen to Coursera? Well, will it you know, in 2023. Oh, it'll definitely happen in 2023. Middle of 2023. Nah, I can't get more specific <laughs> than that. But we're excited about it. I mean, I, it will disrupt a lot of things, and I'm hmm. mostly what we're excited about. This will change the learning experience fundamentally, and I just I think so many people are going to benefit from the kind of personalized but what help. What do you think are the get. biggest risks? Well, the big you kind of already pointed out. I mean, the ability to verify not just whether a written assignment was produced by GPT or, or an individual, but a lot of people don't realize this. Um, well, of course you can always have ChatGPT generate an essay and then change it a little bit. So it's gonna be hard to have technology determine was it ChatGPT, because people are gonna edit it. But the other thing you can do is you can tell ChatGPT, introduce errors, speak in the voice of a 10 year old, speak in the voice of someone who's from this region. Like it can completely modify its style of writing. So assessment is going to be very difficult cheating is going to be rampant and so i you're, and it's already it already is happening kids move quickly on these new technologies faster yeah. than the teachers and faster <laughs> than the schools. so that's going to be a really tricky thing and i think the first thing that schools are going to be thinking about is what do we do to continue to truly assess the capabilities of our students that'll be the biggest challenge initially and then longer term you know it's a thinking tool people are going to think about okay how do we really integrate this mm. new thinking tool into the educational process right final couple of questions yeah. jeff this is something that i struggle with so you should give our viewers some tips and tricks how does one complete a course on coursera I'll just go, <laughs> go, go to coursera.org no, we sign up for a lot of courses but we never end up completing it well i'll tell you if you look at the students in india <laughs> who are taking courses on Coursera for credit as part of their degree, the completion rates are like 95%. No, not credit. For degree, people will study. What that's, about the free right. courses? Well, the free courses, here's the question, is are you taking something where those skills in that certificate will help you get a better job? Generally speaking, when people take Coursera as a hobby, you know, maybe they're taking something on history, and they enjoy it, but there's not really... A need. to finish. Yeah, it's like, oh, look, I'm just doing this for fun. I'm, like you watch YouTube for fun. When you're doing it for your job, when you're doing it for your degree, you finish the whole thing. When you're not, it's entertaining. It's something you can learn, and I think that that's great. So, so we're, how, many, we're, how many courses have you completed on Coursera? Oh, my gosh. I've probably completed, I don't know, 15 or so. 
And what's the one that you're currently studying? I'm, uh, you know, I'm thinking that we need more data expertise at Coursera. So I'm taking the Google Data Analytics course. It's actually a professional certificate program. I'm also taking the University of Amsterdam um, uh, uh, Big History, which is like the history of the universe, which is mm. which is pretty fun as well. Right. On that note, thank you very much for talking to us, Jeff. Pleasure, pleasure. meeting you. My thank pleasure. you. Nice to